astonishing uh, story. Uh, motivated, Ben uh, is, a, is an engineer by training, uh, but uh, their lives were changed when their brother Stephen was diagnosed with ALS in the late 1990s. Uh, the story of Seasons, uh, Stephen's courageous battle against that disease was told in uh, an award-winning documentary called So Much, So Fast, which I believe you can find on Netflix uh, for free, just get it streamed, um, and a Pulitzer Prize-winning book by the acclaimed science writer Jonathan Weiner called His Brother's Keeper, and I urge you to look at both of those. Um, uh, ben is, uh, the, 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 the family launched uh, a, 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 an institute, a non-profit institute called ALS uh, uh, TDI to uh, research cures uh, for uh, ALS and other neurodegenerative disorders. And in 2004, they uh, founded a company called Patients Like Me. We've talked a lot on this stage about the amazing work that uh, consumer genomics companies are doing, like 23andMe. We may hear more about that in the next uh, presentation. Uh, Le uh, providing greater access uh, uh, and uh, uh, empowerment to people's personal genomic information. And there are some parallels with what patients like me are doing, is doing, uh, providing a greater empowerment to individuals, uh, really anybody in this room, to learn and uh, share uh, their own medical uh, information and history and experiences. Uh, and that's what you're going to hear about now. So it's a great pleasure to talk about uh, the integration of real-time discovery and clinical care Ben Hayward, the president and co-founder of Patients Like Me. Ben. Um, well, thank you, uh, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, while we are both uh, actually mechanical engineer, engineers, my brother and I, he actually came, comes from drug discovery. I actually, in my last life, was making movies. So. Um, while I, uh, so I have a slightly different bent on, on the topic today, but um, I think, as Ken said, I, I want to talk a little bit about boots on the ground, a real world example of some of the stuff we're doing, and then also some of the challenges and, and uh, um, uh, 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 the challenges um, as, we, as we enter a world where, of molecular medicine um, about some of the challenges that we need to face and how we, uh, at patients like me, are, are addressing some of them. So, um, there are uh, a lot of forces that are, uh, uh, that are really sort of changing healthcare. And, um, you know, from the empowered patient, molecular medicine, doctor's role, new data sources, payment reform. And I love this quote from Catherine the Great. Uh, a great wind is blowing, and that gives you either imagination or a headache. And, you know, we're a small team of patients like me. We're about 45 people working on this problem. Uh, and I know that just within my team, these five forces give great imagination to that team and massive headaches when they're pulling their hair out trying to d disentangle some of the problems. But today I'm going to talk a little bit more about molecular medicine and actually how that relates to us. Uh, I'm going to touch on that. But first I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing patients like me so you get a sense of how we're sort of looking at the problems that um, the previous speakers, and, and in particular Ken, touched on um, in medicine. So actually just going back on this, I, I think, you know, what's interesting as, as uh, as we're looking at this problem, you know, we are just beginning to take um, genetics and, and put it into the clinic. And that's a static problem. That's a static data set. But as we look um, about the, 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 uh, the introduction of dynamic uh, molecular data sets, um, the quantity and the variability of that is just uh, is exponentially larger. And so, you know, that's a huge problem we're going to need to tackle. And, and on top of that, we need to understand the phenotypic variability of patients in the real world in real time. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like in patients like me. But first, let's just come back to the patient. This is actually uh, my brother, Stephen, who had Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, it's a picture of him floating in the pool. Um, but this quote is actually the driving force of patients like me medical framework. Given my status, what's the best out outcome I can hope to achieve, and how do I get there? And really needs to be the driving force of all of medicine as we bring in all of these technologies, whether it's genetics or molecular uh, medicine or phenotypic uh, information. That's the question that this information needs to answer. So is it about finding a new drug? Yes, yes. But really, it's about a really deep understanding on every level, molecular, genetic, and phenomic understanding of the patient. So what does that look like? So I'm just going to, this is a, 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 a sort of a mini video demo of patients like me. Um, this is our new homepage. We actually recently just launched uh, this week, uh, opening up the site to any condition with um, 
any patient with any condition, but I'm going to just look at a fibromyalgia patient here and, and look at them, the fibromyalgia patients taking Cymbalta. It's actually updating in real time here. You know, let's look at women. So we had 13,000 fibromyalgia patients, 1,700 taking Cymbalta. Uh, women between the ages of 40 and 49, we got 400 patients in the system. And this is all updating dynamically. So here, uh, in our system, a patient is represented by this icon. This is a, what we call a patient nugget, but sort of disease-specific phenotypic information that's tracked over time, as well as quality of life and other information. And on some level, what we really are is a bioinformatics platform wrapped in a social network, wrapped in uh, a, so, uh, a community closing. And what, we, and what we really do is take the patient experience and translate that into data, into computable, useful information sets. So this is a patient profile, and one of the unique things about our site is everything is open. So any patient member can see this patient's profile down to this level, and that means as we aggregate up the data, every data piece of data in the system, you can click back to the original source, and so that's a communi community validation, it's a community trust thing, uh, and it allows for a, a, a better validation of the information in the system. So here we go, James, we're just going through this thing. Functional rating scales over time, that's self-reported by patients. Functional, uh, external, internal stress, the, 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 uh, the, the drugs uh, and interventions patients are taking, but even non-traditional ones like prayer and what they get out of it. Um, so uh, 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 symptoms they're experiencing and what they're taking for it. And uh, so here's a patient taking Cymbalta for pain. Uh, and we're going to click through to that Cymbalta report again, just to show you what you can do when you start to do this in for real time. Here is all the, the fibromyalgia patients and other patients taking Cymbalta in the system. You see the numbers, uh, the ends. You know, you start to approach the size of, tr uh, of clinical trials. Um, you know, you have perceived efficacy. You have perceived side effects. And I'm going to get into that a little bit more uh, on the next slide um, uh, that, that patients are experiencing. Um, so actually, I'm just going to interest of time. Okay, so um, like all data, phenotypic data, if it's well designed, can be arranged to solve new problems. And I think that's one of the things we're starting to do. So this is my brother, ALS King 101 is his uh, username on the system. Uh, these are all the symptoms he was experiencing. These are all the drugs he was taking for both the symptoms and his disease. And then here's all the side effects that are reported in the system from other patients taking those drugs. And if you start to organize that and start to put it in a new way, you get to learn something about Stephen. And we didn't have this when he was alive, but you learn something about it. So um, excess saliva is a very tough problem for, for, for ALS patients. So we were treating that with a number of side effects of drugs he was taking for other things. But a lot of those also took constipation, which we knew. Um, uh, also caused constipation, which we knew. So we were mitigating that with other treatments. But what we didn't really know is that five of these drugs were significantly impacting his insomnia. And had we known that, we might have started to look at that mix a little bit di uh, different, So, so because that was also an issue for him. So again, um, this is taking an individual's patient's information and then looking at the broad, real-time data of all the other patients in the system and, and starting to learn new things. So. Um, Again, some of the things, I think this is some of the uh, outcomes of what you can learn in this scenario. So uh, this is actually uh, uh, talking about Lyric and Cymbalta in fibromyalgia, uh, weight gain side effects. So these are as reported by patients. Now again, this is an apples to orange comparison, but it starts to get you to understand a little bit of the clinical trial data versus patients like me evaluations, which are perceived side effects as reported by patients, obviously significantly higher in that drug, as reported on patients like me. Also over, uh, more, high, uh, more reported on, on these other two, and lots of reasons for that. You know, the New England Journal of Medicine article about why physicians under-reporting this uh, uh, side effects and, and symptoms, um, uh, a, as well as other things. But this is interesting, and it starts to let you see, OK, well, you can start to get this data in real time of ends of significance. Um, to actually do some real evaluations. And why this is important, so a couple things. So this is perceived uh, side effects as patients, but then we also have reported data on their weight. So we can actually start to look at patients' weight, a much more objective measure of this, about relative to when they started taking the drug. Lots of caveats on this. My analytics guys will always want me to caveat, you know, diminishing ends as we go out 90, 180, 270 days. But still, start to see some real significant difference in uh, uh, weight gain between these two drugs, which are primary treatment of fibromyalgia and FDA-approved, 
where weight is a significant cor correlation and exacerbation of the primary morbidity of, the, of that disease. So wow, this is all learned in real time from patients sharing information. OK. So just to bring it back around, uh, uh, <clears throat> so, so right now, right now, patient, right now, patient value is, 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 is really asserted in the system from prior studies. Um, uh, and, and, and it's not really measured in real time, and it's not really a system priority to measure it in real time. Um, discovery research, which we do, uh, everyone in this room is involved with, is incredible, and, 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 but it's done in trials, it's, not, it's done in labs, and it's not done in the within the variance of the real world, which on purpose, but for sometimes for good reasons, but it doesn't allow for real-time capture of, uh, of, of what's happening in the real world. And then lastly, clinical care, it's really transactional, and it's not, it's not patient-centered. So look, uh, so as you start to put the patient in the center and start to measure patient value, um, you know, this is what we're trying to demonstrate. Demonstrate what's possible, that it's possible to do high-quality phenomic outcome research in the real world, in real time. And we're doing this with patient volunteers. I mean, we now have 100,000 patients volunteering this information. We're not connected to the traditional clinical systems. We're doing it completely outside the system, which just imagine what we can do is we can effectively integrate all this stuff, some of the stuff that Ken talked about. OK, so lastly, you know, this, looks to, this, is, this can become a virtuous cycle, right? We, 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 what, the, the ideal world here is we start to measure biology, we measure the phenome, we, we, we make an intervention, and, and, we, and, and we repeat. I, I think I like to think of that as the traditional uh, shampoo bottle, right? Rinse, lather, rinse, repeat, right? It's easy, right? So, um, so what we have to do is we have to understand that. We have to see what changes in real time. We have to make adjustments in real time. Uh, and this is definitely possible, and we're making strides in this realm. But we have to have really detailed phenom phenomic models of disease that can match to the molecular models of the disease as we have these exploding platforms and these exploding data sets um, in order to really begin to understand this and utilize this effectively to change clinical care and individual clinical care uh, for the individual patients. So uh, wrapped up a little early, even with my time, but there we go. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, thank you very much. I'm, I mentioned your brother is talking to a pharma company. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how you hope to engage with pharma, or hope pharma companies will engage with you. Well, um, I think uh, I, I think Yuri's talk summed it up very well. I, I was very happy with, with him as a preface for us. I mean, what we do with pharma primarily is engage with them and bring the patient voice, the patient experience, in a computable you know in a computable format, so data into pharma. Uh, and hopefully start to change their decision-making process around the patient, the end use. So, and we've, we have found that those companies really actively trying to reach out to the patient, engage in the patient, despite a lot of the regulatory burdens, a lot of the hurdles that um, pharma has in terms of directly accessing and engaging with patients. Um, the, uh, we provide many mechanisms to do that um, through, um, you know, from market research all the way down to really deep clinical research, and actually, as I mentioned, really deep phenomic modeling of disease as well. So we have a broad range of services, and, uh, we, you know, we work with many of the top, you know, 20 pharma in that capacity. And when do you start incorporating genomic data? Well, we do a little bit today. So on an individual disease basis, we ask for the known variances. Um, we did a small pilot with uh, 23andMe where we were collecting Parkinson's uh, both individual basis, and then we actually asked a number of patients for our geneticists to, to, to have data to play with to upload their entire SNP uh, analysis from 23andMe. Um, we, the answer is when we have an effective, uh, we have a, uh, a uh, a, uh, an engaged pharma partner or another partner willing to, to work with us to pay for it, because it's not, we can't do that on a small scale. And again, we're just 45 people over in Cambridge over here trying to, trying to make a dent in the, this $2.4 trillion healthcare, uh, 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 whatever it is. 